Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Dawn Bennett with Nature of Relationships, and I'm super excited to have Amanda Johnson and Aaron Johnson here. They are mother and son, and they are the co-authors of a book, A Religion of Story. And they wrote this amazing book about relationships and, well, stories, movies, right? And how characters uh, can actually reflect who we are in life. I mean, I'm not explaining that very well. You have to read the book yourself, but thank you for coming. And we're going to talk today about chapter four about friendships. So tell me a little bit about how you got the idea for this chapter and how it all came out and how this all developed for you. Yeah, well, uh, Aaron and I are uh, certified story junkies, Mm -hmm. which means that since he was little, we have spent a lot of time talking about story, watching story, debating story. And when he was 16, I think we had one conversation that made me realize like, oh, this has been really important to shaping his worldview. He was making some ethical decisions based on what he had learned from the stories that we had watched. So I asked him if he would write this book with me um, because I was like, wow, this is amazing that this has shaped your worldview without me even kind of knowing how deeply, right? But it had become a language for us. Um, So we started working on the book and we knew we were going to co-write it. I've helped other people co-author books and I know that it can get really weird and messy trying to figure out what is the format going to look like? How how are people going to know when he's talking, when I'm talking? And sometimes we worked on pieces together. So while we were trying to sort all of that out, um, I decided that it was probably best to start with the easiest chapter for him to write, um, which I thought was going to be the easiest chapter for him to write at the time. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's actually how it panned out. But each each um, chapter in the book has a theme. So we have uncertainty, self knowledge, training, camaraderie, which we're talking about today, redemption, destiny, and then leadership. And so it follows the arc of his um, of his life. So those first three chapters, he was like, mm, I don't remember a lot of that, you know, like, what are we going to do? Like, I'll, I'll do the heavy writing on those parts. And so chapter four was kind of that space where he was starting to gain awareness and we were starting to have conversations, um, really specifically connecting his experience in the world with stories um, that we were watching. And Harry Potter was like his favorite. I, I don't know. You can't really call it even a favorite. That word doesn't do it justice. I know. But. That's right. <laughs> exactly. And when I, you know, first starting to write the chapters while we were figuring it out, I took um, everything as an analytical, you know, technical writing perspective before incorporating my own story. So when I was doing that with the technical writing, it was very easy because I got to talk about Harry Potter. That was it and how it related but not how it related to my life and actual relationships I had. And that was extremely, that was more difficult um, because I'd actually had lots of trouble with relationship with friends um, earlier on in life before high school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it made it kind of a, a tricky, some tricky waters for us mm-hmm. to navigate. Like <laughs> the, the analytical part just flew out of him and it was so good and so amazing. And then when we decided to start inserting stories, he was like, Oh, chapter four. Oh, no. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And I'm like, I know because relationships have been hard for me too, which is why I loved having a story like Harry Potter to sort through some of those things with him. Like looking at, um, you know, one of the things that we talk about in there is like every, you know, in chapter two, we talk about superpowers and, and understanding your self-knowledge, and then you find a mentor to help train you, right? In chapter three, and then chapter four, you realize like, okay, I got these superpowers, but also I have this kryptonite. Like there are some weaknesses that I need to work on, or frankly, there are just some things that I'm just never going to do because I don't like them. Research. <laughs> like, <right? laughs> some things. And so, then comes the conversation of like, we need allies. If we're going to accomplish big missions in the world, like defeating the dark Lord Voldemort or running a business, we have to have people around us who we can work together and collaborate with the different superpowers. 
So that was like one of the key things that we um, we talked about through that process. But but then the sticky part came when we started having conversations around like, well, there there are a lot of things that happen uh, around their arc, right, Aaron? Where you have these like accidental betrayals that happen, right? Someone makes a decision without asking someone else, or makes a decision for the group instead of. Um, consulting first, right? Like, cause it's a scary situation. Then they have to go and clean it up. And so these are all the things that I don't know, Dawn, did they teach you how to do this in school? Cause they did not teach. No. Here's how to have a conversation. Like taught in school, right? Except for like, cool. try to be nice to people. And then, yeah. and then yeah. do people really do that in school? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> that didn't really happen. No. They really yeah. Didn't. Even so, when we think we're being nice sometimes. I mean, my mom was just talking about how she's at her, like, whatever, 50th high school reunion or something like that. And they were, her and her friend were talking to this woman and, and they were like, yeah, you were super mean in junior high. She's like, I was? When was I mean? <laughs> and my mom was like, you did this and you said this. And she's like, really? Like, I don't. So I think sometimes even like we're just doing the best we can in the moment, but how do we go around and, and heal that and repair that? And that's what you're talking about, right? Is finding allies, finding like these, accent of the trails, but how you shift that. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Cause I mean, it's really cool to use your superpowers and it's really fun to work together while everything is going really well, mm-hmm. but when it gets messy and no one has taught you how to identify emotions, like that hurt my feelings that felt like a betrayal um, that felt shady like what you did, I don't think you probably tried it, but it felt kind of shady, right? Like if if no one teaches us that, then we do one of two things. We either like explode because we don't know, and then we mess up our friendships or we internalize all of that stuff and don't talk to anyone about it, and especially them. And then we have to kind of like become other people to try to feel like, we still belong, even though doing that makes us not belong. Mm. So yeah. how do you recommend that people use story, whether it be movies, whether it be books, whether it be whatever, you know, social media platforms, <laughs> whatever it is that they're engaging in to actually make self change and bring it into self-awareness instead of being like getting caught up in the drama of it or the typicality of, oh yeah, that's how relationships work. Yeah. Friendship. This is how women act. This is how men act. This Mm. is how you're supposed to be, you know, because we can get like, like sometimes story just portrays the, the stereotype, right? So how have you two used that to actually leverage your own self-knowledge to become better people in the world and to create a better relationship between yourselves? Uh, Well, I'd say, um, like I said earlier, you know, I had a lot of trouble um, when I was younger, making friends that were like, like, you know, you can have friends, but then you have like the friends that, you know, you're going to be friends with for life. And I never had those. Um, mm-hmm. I had a few of them that I thought like would be like that, but there were all these things that would happen these fallings out, you know, and whatnot, distancing, you know, friend groups, all the drama, right. Of everything like that. And I think it really depends on what the issue is in terms of what, how you view relationships and what's happening with your relationships in the moment. But I'll say for me, being able to see um, re- relationships on the screen helped me be like, okay, I want that. It's actually like that. Um, and I want to be able to um, have people like this around me. Mm-hmm. Actually, I, and this isn't necessarily about friends, even though it, I mean, it. when mom asked me while we were watching Harry Potter, who's your favorite character? I said, Professor McGonagall. And she was like, what the hell? <laughs> that makes no sense. <laughs> This old teacher, you know, none of the main people, the heroes, even the villains, you know what, like what's this kind of not side character, but yeah, like side character. And um, she knew that it was because um, I wanted someone, a mentor, friendship, relationship like that in my life. And I hadn't had one like that before. Mm. and um, I wanted my own Professor McGonagall, and and thankfully I got that in high school, and she's actually calls herself Professor McGonagall. It was literally kind of weird and crazy, but things like that, and also, you know, um, I think for me, being able to, there's a a part in the chapter about friendships forged through fire, 
And seeing that on the screen, I, I did, I remember thinking to myself, watching that um, at some point being like, is that the only way to have friendships? Like I have to be through a traumatic event with someone, you know what I mean? And I got to have that with mock trial that wasn't necessarily traumatic, except for that one time that we don't talk about. And so, um, and so seeing all those things and those patterns and being able to understand, like to be able to see the ideal and then shoot for that, have an intention for that. Um, I think that's been how that has shown up for me with story and friendships, relationships. Yeah. Yeah. And the really good stories, you know, the ones that aren't just stereotypical, but the ones that um, use stereotypes really intentionally, you know, the, the epic ones, you know, the Harry Potters and the the Hunger Games and, you know, these types of stories that feel a little bit more they're fantastic, but they feel more true in a way, right? They feel like you're watching a friend group that's possible, mm-hmm. you know, like, oh. And so we would have conversations like, okay, so what happened there? This person, you know, um, one of the great examples from Harry Potter is, you know, there's that part where Ron leaves because he's been carrying the holocrux and he's getting really, really dark. And, um, and then he starts to suspect that Harry and Hermione are having feelings for each other. Right. And then he just bolts and they're both wounded. And there's this moment where they're dancing in the tent together. And I remember thinking like, this is such a beautiful moment. It made me cry the first few times I watched it because it was like, was it friendship were they starting to have feelings like these were the questions that the authors and the movie makers were trying to get us to ask. Right. So instead of just having all of those thoughts and feelings myself, I'd pause the, I'd pause it. I'd look at Aaron. He'd be like, Oh my God, again. And then we would have a conversation about it. Like, what do you think? You know, do you feel like it's turning into something more like girlfriend, boyfriend, or do you feel like they've just been through some stuff together or, you know, like, really helping him to sort out what he was feeling and experiencing. And then how do they make that repair when they come back? Right. Because she's pissed and Ron is like remorseful and Harry's like, I don't know what to do here. We we have a mission that we have to do. So you two got to figure this out. And so, you know, ha- being able to pause and have those conversations of like, what would be your first approach to this, right? Well, if no one has taught you how to do that, you're looking to the characters for an answer. And then, well, that kind of worked. Eh, maybe that wouldn't have worked with my friend. But if I phrased it like this, or if I asked a question like this, you know, there was no blaming when they said this or that there was they were taking responsibility for their actions right like really identifying these basic emotional literacy things that are happening easily on the screen in front of us but not so easily in our relationships and just like that's a better script than the one i've been using with my friends when this goes wrong i'm gonna try it and see what happens so that's kind of how those those conversations go yeah, it's so interesting when I listen to you guys talk about um, story, because I was never, well, once I kind of got to like high school, I was like, movies are boring. It's all the same. La, 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 la. And I never really sat down to really think about how the characters are actually teaching me something. Mm-hmm. Right. But I knew that I was always drawn to movies that were outside of the scope of the normality. Like I didn't want to watch the same old boring rom-com and I want to watch the same old boring comedy. I wanted the ones that made me think and that like life yeah. is a house and all these weird, like, yeah, love that one. Movies. yeah. Um, American beauty, right. Where there's so much conflict of like, and all this hidden hiddenness underneath there. So um, you guys have really inspired that in me as well. Yeah. What's your goal with this book, a religion of story, like beyond like all the ways that you're teaching others to have these really strong relationships and to notice where they are in different areas. Right. I mean, that's, Mm -hmm. that's part of your mission yes is to kind of tie in relationships in all these different ways so tell me how you what you're hoping to make an impact in both in yourselves and your friend groups and your circles and in the greater world at large well for me it started with this realization that I had something with Aaron that other parents don't 
that other parents use, um, you know, like TV time to just chill out, right? Like end of a long day, you know, and they're missing out on this opportunity to really get to know their kid. Like, really? That's your favorite character? Why? You know, but that gave me some sort of insight into who he was and what he needed. He was telling me he needed a teacher who who knew how magical he was and could bend some rules sometimes. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, and so I could, I could ask him like, what would that person look like? And, you know, and then when we, when he found her, he came home and he was like, mom, I found professor McGonagall. Like, (laughs) and she literally, you know what I mean? So it becomes this language and it makes even the relaxing time that we would normally just sit there and consume something for entertainment, an opportunity to not just, you know, help develop and cultivate character in our kids, but really get to know them. Like, I feel like, um, I know him better than most parents know their 19 year old kids. And I think because of the fact, the way that I did it really not just putting him on the spot, like, what do you think about this? But when he turned to me and he'd be like, well, why do you, you know, I'd be like, man, this has me all messed up because of the relationships I had when I was little, like, I'm not sure. Right. And so he, that, that first relationship between parent and child, I think is the one that matters the most to me right now, because I feel like if we can get that right, you know, then, um, we have developed critical thinking, we've developed, um, connection and safety in our homes. And that's something that they can take into the world with them on whatever they end up pursuing. So that's, that's where I started. And where I still feel like that's the most exciting part for me. Does that resonate with you, Aaron? Or do you have a little different spin being the quote unquote child? Yeah, right. Um, I would say, I mean, I think the the primary goal of the book is to help parents, right? Be able to understand uh, what we did, how we did it, how now they can use it with their kid. And I think, um, you know, mostly where my heart resides is with the child and being able to experience what I experienced and be able to have a lens um, and understand that there is always a purpose to story and then always to ask questions about story and then how that relates to the real world. Um, so that we're not just always sitting around watching things happen to us, right? And understand that things happen for us and that um, that there's all like a like a collective and individual story that we all have a part in, so... Yeah. And I love that because even when I hang out with my nephews, like sometimes they'll tell me who, who their favorite character is or what their favorite show is that they're watching. Mm-hmm. But I never have thought about actually using it to get deeper of like why and understand who they are. Because when I talk to them about like, tell me about your friends, tell me about your friendships, like, it's fine. Like they can't, there's no words for it. But, mm-hmm. but I love how you have phrased that, Amanda, of like, you're getting to learn those things that they don't know how to communicate in their own life through how they feel and how they interact with the story in front of them. But it does require the adult to do the same thing. And that's mm-hmm. the trick. So, um, you know, the parents are kids, kids ask a lot of questions. And if you do a really good job of asking them questions, guess what comes back at you. So you better be ready <laughs> to be like, um, my favorite character. I mean, we've, we've had funny conversations where we'll be watching something and we'll pause it and I'll say, who's your favorite character? And he's like, oh, it's her, but I don't think it should be like, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, me too. Why is that? Right. And, and so we can talk about how, what do we love about this? Oh, she is like, um, absolutely doesn't give a crap what people think. Like she is just going to accomplish her mission no matter what. And mm-hmm. so we both agree she goes too far (laughs) and here are the ways that she does that. But we can, we can be like, we both love that about her because we know we're capable of it. And we need to lean into that more because we're both dealing with similar people right now where we need to like not care so much. Right. Mm -hmm. And so having that, being able to have that um, reflective space internally to say, why is this person just pissing me off? So much? Like, I hate this character. <laughs> you know, when you like, I don't like that character, but like you hate the character, like you want to throw something at the television. Like there's a reason for that. Why? As, who do they remind you of? 
or are they doing something that you wish you could do? Or, you know, all of those questions that you could ask and get answers to some of the answers are scary. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you got, you're like, well, I think it's this. And I think that's kind of scary. What do you think about that? And if you're a kid, if you have that relationship, then you get to grow together and there's no, um, it levels out like all of that weird authoritative hero worship that goes on naturally with parents and children, right? Because we take care of them when they can't take care of themselves. And then some parents get to a place where they're on these pedestals and they feel like they can't tell their kid that like, uh, I don't know what the hell I'm doing right now. Like, this is the first time I've ever raised a 13 year old with these questions. I have nothing. I'm going to go talk to my people right now and get back to you. So much freedom for me. And also I've just shown him that it's okay for him to not have answers and to go resource his people when he needs it. But we have this weird thing where like the adults and the authority figures can't show vulnerability and humanity. And I think that's where we really get things messed up with our kids because then they feel like they got to pretend. Awesome. Any final closing words about your book, A Religion of Story? which I'll put the link down below for all the people in YouTube. It's on Amazon. It's a bestseller, but by the way, congratulations on that. That's super fantastic. But any last words, any last thoughts, recommendations, things you want to say to the the audience? Um, You know, when you binge a show, it's not always the worst thing (laughs) as long as you're doing it the right way (laughs) by engaging it mindfully and eating a lot of great food and chocolate. So I don't feel like I can add anything more to that. It, it's what okay. it's all about. <laughs> right. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for joining me again. And um, I look forward to seeing you guys soon. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.